Welcome. My name is Mikhailo Minakov, the Canons Institute Senior Advisor on Ukraine and Editor-in-Chief of Focus Ukraine, Canons Institute's uh, Ukraine Focus blog. Thank you all for joining us for a very special presentation today to discuss key results from a large representative phone survey of over 4,000 respondents from both sides of the territorial divide in Donbass. I'd like to thank the Center for Eastern European and International Studies, better known as TSOIS, in Berlin for co-sponsoring today's event. I encourage you to stay up to date on the latest Canon Institute events and publications by visiting our website and subscribing to our two blogs, Focus Ukraine and The Russia File, as well as our podcasts, Canon X and The Russia File. Visit our Hinsight Upfront Ukraine collection on the website of Wilson Center for the latest news and analysis focused on Ukraine. If you'd like to ask a question during the course of this conversation, you can submit it via email to canon at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Canon Institute, or on our Facebook page at any time. Please include your name and affiliation when sending questions. I will begin by introducing all three of our speakers now and allow them to describe their recent findings before we turn to questions. Let me begin by introducing Dr. John Laughlin. He is College Professor of Distinction at the University of Colorado, Boulder. For past 30 years, he has worked in the former Soviet Union on changing geopolitical or or orientations, on territorial separatism and its consequences, on de facto states, and on the spatial uh, analysis of violent events. His current research examines the geopolitical orientations of residents of the former Soviet states, gathering 12,000 surveys in two waves in six, six countries and five territories, and separately on 6,000 uh, 6, respondents in the Donbass. Our next speaker is Gwendolyn Zasse who has been the director of the Center for Eastern European and International Studies at SOIS in Berlin since 2016. She is also Einstein professor. Uh, she's also Einstein professor for the uh, comparative study of democracy and authoritarianism at Humboldt University, Berlin, senior research fellow at Nuffield College, University of Oxford, and non-resident senior fellow at Carnegie Europe. Her research interests include post-communist transition, especially Ukraine and Russia, the dynamics of ethnic conflict, war, displacement, and migration. Her current research focuses on the war in Eastern Europe, youth attitudes in Russia, and the relationship between voice and exit. Her book, The Crimea Question, Identity, Transition, and Conflict, Harvard University Press, published in 2007, won the Alexander Nov Prize of the British Association for Slavonic and East European Studies. And last, I'd like to introduce Jared Toll. Dr. Toll is a political geographer and a founding figure in the creation of critical geopolitics, a professor of international affairs at Virginia Tech's Greater Washington Area Campus. He is the recipient of multiple research grants from the US National Science Foundation. His last book, Near Broad, Put in the West and the, Conquest, uh, and the Contest for Ukraine and the Caucasus, won the International Studies Association, ANMIA, Distinguished Book Award in 2019. He is currently completing the book manuscript, Oceans Rise, Empires Fall, How Geopolitics Hastens Climate Change. Now, colleagues, the floor is yours. John. Great. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, greetings from Boulder. It's uh, around zero degrees and uh, snowing. Um, so I will introduce the project. Um, I will introduce the data. Uh, I will introduce the methodology and a couple of the early slides. And then I'll pass it to Gwen, and then she will talk further and then pass it to Jared. Uh, I'll begin by uh, sharing the screen, hopefully. 
Okay, so um, the title of this particular project or talk today is Public Opinion in the Divided Donbass, and it reports the um, preliminary and early data from a very large survey that Mikhail uh, talked about in the Donbass on both sides of the line of contact. Um, and again, before I begin, just want to acknowledge that it's funded by ZOAS as well as by the National, US National Science Foundation. Um, but it's part of a much bigger project, as Mikhail uh, referred to, um, of um, across the former Soviet Union, multiple states and territories. And we have uh, Kristen Bach at University College London, as well as Marlene Narwhal at George Washington University, also involved in the wider project. So um, what I want to do is give a little bit of background to what happened here. Um, last year, um, in uh, almost exactly a year ago, uh, we made a presentation um, that reported data from late 2020, again, on both sides of the line of uh, contact in the Donbass, and we compared the results to the ZOAS work of a year earlier in 2019. And there were some significant differences and really weren't readily explainable um, based on the one year difference between the two surveys. So Gwen and I sort of, began to talk and, and um, sort of came up with the idea that maybe there is an effect here of the survey company. And basically, uh, respondents are answering questions differentially to, based on where uh, the company uh, is calling from. So in other words, if they're calling from Kiev or from Moscow, um, you, you get different responses. So to try and kind of tackle that question, which in a way is a, an experimental question, we um, decided to, in late uh, last year, really less than about two months ago, to conduct this much bigger survey. And here um, I will give some kind of, I'll skip the background, but obviously um, the Donbass is now the focus of much of the uh, wider geopolitical discussions, um, but what we want to do is really focus in on the people living in this region rather than the bigger, broader geopolitical questions that tend to dominate the news headlines, as uh, this one here from New York Times a couple of days ago. Um, again, just to clarify before I begin, uh, everybody understands what we're talking about here. So we're talking about the Donbass in its broader uh, terms of the two full oblasts, right? And then when we talk about the line of contact, we're talking about the line that's marked on this map. On the one side, we have the uh, so-called Luhansk People's Republics and then the Donetsk People's Republic. Uh, and on the other side, of course, the area we, we refer to or generally refer to as the government controlled area. Um, so that's the kind of geographic background, just to make sure everybody knows the two uh, areas. So the design here is to, <clears throat> repeat exactly the same questionnaire in all locations with three different companies. So we're using Kies, uh, the Ukrainian company, uh, also our research, we, who are based in the, in the UK. And both of them conducted the survey in the government controlled area, a thousand respondents each. And then on the other side of the line, and sorry, there's a very strange um, misprint here, um, Levada marketing research in Moscow and Kies again on the non-government controlled area. So um, the methodology here is the so-called uh, computer-assisted telephone interviewing. And again, you know, literally tens of thousands of phones are fo uh, called. And then uh, based on those who answer their phone and there is some contact with the interviewers, the response rate here is about 10% for uh, these phones. Um, and again, the surveys were done between the 15th and 27th of January. So just uh, about a month ago. Um, some summary statistics very quickly. I just want to highlight these so we can get to our sort of key questions. Um, the survey respondents are predominantly female, not unusual, by the way, uh, across the former Soviet Union. Um, probably the ratio here is on the order of uh, six to eight percent higher than uh, surveys that we've done elsewhere um, in the former Soviet Union. Uh, it's a predominantly middle-aged uh, and older uh, sample. Um, the one thing that stood out to me was the very high ratio of poverty among the um, sample, among the respondents, where 42% said they could not afford food or could only afford food and nothing else. So those are the, the usual markers of poverty 
uh, using this question about what you can afford as a measure of income. And the ratio is a bit higher in the government controlled area than in the non-government controlled area. Another statistic that stands out is that 55% of the respondents report that they have suffered during the course of the conflict since 2014 in the Donbass. And that means, you know, they are forced to move. They have family members who were killed or injured. Um, again, it's higher in the government controlled area than in the non-government controlled area. Um, the nationality, again, overall, and this is a self-reported um, preference or indication of nationality, 65% Ukrainian, 27% Russian, and then 8% others. Um, but again, there is a big difference on both sides of the line of contact. On the government control side, the ratio of Ukrainians is 78% and 50% in the non-government controlled area. And then an open question about what's the biggest problem that you face currently. And people could literally say anything, and then it was recoded into uh, main categories. But you can see here that about a third said that economic problems, poverty, income, pension, low pensions, that sort of thing. Uh, said it was the biggest problem. 23%, about a quarter, said that the war and its effects, that is, uh, concerns about shelling, uh, forced move, separation from uh, family, uh, is their biggest concern. And then about 13% mentioned poor health services, education, poor roads, that sort of thing. Uh, overall, about a third of the respondents have been forced to move since um, 2014. And then one question we always ask in these surveys, uh, we ask the interviewers at the end of the survey, was the respondent uncomfortable with the um, survey? And you can see here that 63%, um, um, the, the interviewer said the respondents had no difficulty. Um, but again, it varies. For the key interviewers in the non-government controlled area, they said only 52% uh, were comfortable. Um, by contrast, Lovato report that 71% were comfortable. Okay, so we have um, some key questions. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple and then pass it to Glenn. Uh, the ones I'm going to talk about are, who do you blame for the conflict? And we have two blame questions. One about the ongoing conflict, in other words, the situation since 2014. And then we have one about the current escalation in um, in the conflict. So I'm going to uh, report it here according to the four companies, sorry, the, the four surveys, the three companies. Um, and the reason for that is because of questions regarding how uh, respondents are answering the questions according to who's phoning from where. So again, <clears throat> you'll see big differences across the um, companies. So if you, if I, put the category Ukrainian government and the West into one block, and then the Russian government and the, the separatist uh, republic leaders into another. Um, you'll see, again, significant differences across. The one thing I would draw your attention to in these slides is that the data for keys in the government controlled areas and our research also in the government controlled areas are really quite similar. The ratios are, are remarkably similar for these questions. The big difference comes in the separatist area in the uh, DNR, LNR between Kiss and uh, Nevada. And so you can see very clearly here, <clears throat> the blame for the Ukrainian government is much higher, 70% uh, among the Nevada respondents compared to around 30% for the uh, Kiss and the R research respondents. So who's to blame for the current escalation uh, in the Donbass now? Again, it's, it's a similar you know, difference between um, the KIS uh, NGA and the KIS, um, sorry, the CGA, the, the government controlled areas and the non-government controlled areas. The big difference is, is also evident here. What I, again will draw your attention to is how similar the uh, our research and the key GCA ratios are, and then how different, this is the green bar, um, the ratio is with the Lovada um, results. Again, um, the one thing that kind of struck me about this is that it's not a symmetrical blame. In other words, people who answer in the um, separatist republics in the non-government controlled areas tend to blame the West and the Kyiv government 
Um, whereas um, the same kind of reciprocation um, is certainly present. In other words, uh, people in the um, government controlled areas do blame the Russian, sorry, do blame the Russian government, you can see here. But the one thing is there's a lot of blame associated with their own government on the government control side. That is people in the government control side tend to give, to attribute a lot of blame to the West, to NATO, and to the Kiev government in a way that is not um, reciprocated in a sense on the um, other side in the separatist republics. So with that, I will pass it on to uh, Gwen. There is a big difference by nationality, but I, I'll just skip that. So Gwen has um, her. So Gwen, this is your. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, I'll continue with a couple of questions which are um, probably in particular very topical at the moment, but it is also the first one I'm going to talk about is also something that we need to do more analysis on, but we asked um, what should be the status of the territories um, currently not controlled by uh, Kiev. And what we see on this slide is, um, again, the overall samples. So here we've um, amalgamated the, the four surveys. And it looks like a rather sort of clear cut, cut majority for two different options of having a special status within Ukraine or um, no particular um, uh, special status. So going back to the status um, these territories had before the war. And that is together remaining part of Ukraine um, is the uh, majority response here. If we look over the four surveys, um, the next two options are being part of the, the Russian Federation without an autonomy status or without a special status, and then um, just um, um, with a special status. Um, we also included the option of independence, and of course, as always, don't know and refuse, very important. If we go on and try to sort of maybe unpick what looks like a rather clear cut image here, and again, we do it by survey company. Um, you see very clearly that again, case um, in the um, government controlled areas um, and our research in the government controlled areas uh, produce very similar results. So that's also really reassuring uh, in terms of the, um, uh, that the two surveys align and, and we, we, we seem to um, get to similar conclusions. And you see this overall overwhelming uh, vote for um, uh, these areas to remain part of Ukraine. We haven't, for sort of visibility reasons, we haven't, haven't uh, further distinguished now between special status and, and no special status. But where you see, again, a bit in line with what um, Joel um, said about some of the other questions already, we see a big divide between um, the Levada survey and the key survey in the non-government controlled areas. And while um, the um, Levada results very clearly point um, towards the two options combined here, that these um, territories should be part of the Russian Federation, the key survey uh, produces a majority for um, um, the region to remain part of Ukraine, but you see more diversity there and you see a higher share of people who say, who didn't know how to answer the question, in particular these are don't knows, and then a very small uh, number of people, I think it was less than 2% refused to answer this question as with other questions. So I suppose what one could do is to, I mean, our, our um, uh, suggestion at the moment is that um, don't knows here really uh, reflect um, not only uncertainty, but perhaps also an unwillingness to say um, what their real option or preference um, would be. And maybe some of the donors would get added to the red bar here being part of um, the Russian Federation as the preferred option. We don't, of course, know this, but as there is a marked difference also in the um, don't know um, answers, this is um, something that we need to explore further. Um, when we compare these results that clearly um, are, are fight quite far apart, if we compare, however, the Levada results um, from January 2022 to the Levada results from 2020, we see an increase. Um, I think then it was about 50% um, saying they, that the territories should become part of um, the Russian Federation, and now we're here at, at about 70%. So that sentiment measured by Levada has increased. Whereas if we look at the key data for the non-government controlled areas, 
we can compare it to the source data that was um, collected at the end of 2019 with our research, um, so the UK-based UK company. And then the results are very similar here that you see on the screen um, compared to those results there. So while kind of the Lavada figures have slightly changed in that direction, even more support for um, being part of the Russian Federation, um, the, the KIS and the former R research results are rather similar um, for the non-government controlled areas. So, but as I say, this in particular will, will require uh, some more, more analysis. We then also asked um, a question that was um, introduced this time around into the surveys. Um, if Russia introduces uh, troops into your city, Rayon, what will you do? Um, there's one proviso that the R research sample did not include the um, option we would welcome them, that you see a bit further along the line at the, at the bottom. And here we again look at um, an overall picture of the sample, and we see um, uh, very consistently also then of course you will see in a moment um, the, the different uh, survey companies. The middle option here, stay at home, do nothing, um, is by far the um, most frequent response, whereas armed resistance, civil resistance um, are um, by far not as pronounced and also not as pronounced as, for example, keys measured in December for, however, um, Eastern Ukraine more generally, where they came up with, with figures um, close to um, 20%, I think it was. Um, what uh, we see if we um, break it down by um, survey company, the option welcome the troops is most pronounced, um, maybe not surprisingly, um, by the or in the Levada survey. And we also see um, uh, fairly high numbers of, of people who say they don't know. So I think we see here that um, those who live in the areas closest to um, the contact line and obviously they live amidst an ongoing war uh, the maybe more shall I say realistic calculations of what you would do um, seem to point towards um, not doing very much and you have to get on with things whereas we can also see in the countrywide keys data that the further you are away the more likely you are um, to say that you would either engage in armed resistance or in civil resistance and at this point I will pass it on to Jawad. Okay, uh, thank you, Gwen. Um, so I want to say a little bit about what we call the Victoria question. Uh, we reported the results of this in the first publication from this research, which was in uh, the Monkey Cage blog in the Washington Post this last week. Um, it is a question which is named after this uh, lady here, um, and it is from um, <clears throat> the book by Tim Judah in wartime, and it's an interview with uh, um, Victoria uh, de Medchenko, who was then in 2014 a 27-year-old woman uh, living in Slavyansk. And she had the following to, to say to, um, to Tim. Um, it does not matter if I live in Russia or Ukraine. All I want is a good salary. Now I can't even afford a new pair of shoes. So what we did is we took this question uh, because we felt that it actually articulated something very, very important uh, on the ground. Uh, we had other uh, conversations with uh, researchers, many excellent researchers, uh, in Ukraine from the region that are, uh, uh, you know, currently doing excellent research on uh, what is happening there under very difficult circumstances and, and of course are in an extremely difficult situation right now. Um, and so what we did is we modified that and we came up with this question. It doesn't matter to me which country I live in. All as I want is a good salary and then a good pension. And I think this question is really, really important for three reasons. First of all, it puts front and center a trade-off, an important trade-off. It's a direct statement of a desire for a better life um, and before identification with country, with flag or with ruler. Uh, so the private realm comes first and economics trumps uh, national sentiment. 
and and implicitly this uh, you know for academics uh, holds a utilitarian social contract uh, vision of the state. So I think that's why it's important. First of all, there's a trade-off. Secondly, there's an investment. Uh, it gets at the degree to which people are invested in the conflict. And we have combined this strongly agree and agree here, but we actually have those uh, that data, which gives us the sense of the degree to which people are uh, intensely uh, disagreeing with this or intensely agreeing with it. And it's structured in such a way that you sort of have to um, actively choose to disagree because the general sentiment is to agree to a, a particular statement. Uh, so I think that that's very, very useful. And thirdly, it's a question that we have asked a number of times, and so we now have data over time on this. And it's a useful measure of the degree to which an enduring conflict has successfully sort of promoted identification or not uh, with the people who are caught up in it. And, and I think these results are really quite striking. Uh, and they, they tell us something very, very important. Majorities on both sides prioritize the social contract more than a state's identity. Majorities are not invested in the binary terms of the conflict, Russia or Ukraine. And, and after eight years of conflict, the majorities are not passionate about the terms of the conflict. Now, this I think is a really important qualifier on the whole question about status. And it's a sort of a check for us as researchers and people who are very motivated about understanding the geopolitical identities and the uh, particular uh, aspirations and passions of people. And we come in often and you know, in this, this is true of the Donbass conflict. The Donbass conflict, in part, it's caught up in uh, conflicts which are at a broader scale. And among people in the region themselves may not necessarily be invested in the same way as those of us that do research uh, on these conflicts and those of us who think maybe in binary terms about it. So I think it's a very, very important sort of wake up. Uh, uh, now, there are a few things to say about this question. Poor residents and younger people are more likely to agree that they don't care uh, what country they live in. Uh, and interestingly, uh, those most affected by the war are less likely to agree with that statement suggesting that they are invested in which country they live in more than family well-being. And that may have to do something with experience with violence. So therefore, it really matters if you, you know, if you've lost a relative or lost property, uh, have been shelled by um, one side or the other, then it matters to you because of that wartime experience. So that's something that we're going to have to look at. Uh, just a few other things in terms of the survey companies and the details. The highest strongly agree in this survey uh, uh, was in the key surveys uh, in both the government controlled areas and the non-government controlled areas. And it was virtually equal at uh, that strongly agree that that's not simply uh, the combined figure we have here. And that was at virtually equal at 30 percent. And so almost one third strongly agreed with that. Um, the highest strongly disagree was in the key survey in the government controlled areas at 24%. Um, and the highest refuse was in the key survey in the non-governmental controlled areas, but that was only 14%, but still it was the highest refuse, which gets at the, the sort of difficulty of that particular survey uh, and you know the degree to which we need to commend KEIS for serving in the non-government controlled areas, uh, because that's really provided us with some very, very important insight into the power of political desirability in shaping um, you know, surveys and a sort of a corrective to us as we try to get some sense of what is going on uh, among ordinary people on the ground in, in this area. So with that, that's uh, all I have to say on it. So we can turn it back, uh, back over to you, uh, Michaelo. Yes, thank you very much, Gerard. Thank you, colleagues. And uh, well, I would like to start with 
uh, several questions for myself. I cannot resist of uh, taking over the ground and having these egoistic questions. But I'll start with something that definitely interests uh, our audience and it should be just repeated because John have actually made a statement. So uh, once again, in, 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 a, in a nutshell, uh, how did you do this research? What was the response rate and what margin of error do you think your study has? So it's just a, a short a question. And then I ask three of you to, to try and speculate even uh, about the bigger picture. Uh, I know that all of you were doing uh, this research on Donbass for at least uh, six years and maybe longer. And uh, do you see differences between the population on the government controlled and non controlled territories growing? What is the dynamics? Because today we were discussing basically a snapshot on uh, what's going on now. But in a historical perspective, in several years, what was going on and how do you see this picture? Thank you. Who would like to start? I'll start, I'll answer the kind of methodological question. And uh, since I don't like speculation, I'll leave that to my colleagues. <laughs> um, and especially Gwen, who, uh, you know, did a survey in this region in 2016, the first time. So there is uh, five or six years of, of information. Um, yeah, Mikhail, thank you for the question about the methodology of the project. As I, as I said at the beginning, um, because the ZOAS results in 2019 were different than the results we got in 2020. And because the results we got uh, on the government control side, which Keyes did in 2020, and the non-government control side, which Levada did in 2020, uh, that's when Gwen and I started talking about, well, let's kind of set up an experiment here. Let's see how responses might change if, um, in a sense, a company is calling into a place that doesn't fit the origins of the company, right, where the, the, where the company is based. Um, so the key comparison here, I think, is between not only across, well, there's two comparisons. The, the across the line of contact, obviously, is, is an important comparison, but also how the results for keys in the um, non-government controlled area differ from the Levada results in the same place, okay? Um, I will say, by the way, at the beginning, which I, I should have emphasized, is these are very reputable companies. These are not sort of fly-by-night operators. Um, and so um, their methodology, their procedures, I think, are about as good as one could find um, in, in this region. Um, so the way it works, um, as I said before, our research and um, Keys uh, are calling from Kiev and Levada are calling from Moscow. And I asked um, the companies in, in the last week to kind of give us an indication of the extent to which respondents know the origin of the phone call. In other words, you know, who, who's phoning basically. And they, and, and they can see it from either the country code, you know, calling from Russia, country code seven, or uh, from calling from uh, Kiev. So I think that's an important element in, in the whole story. Um, again, as I said, there are tens of thousands of calls made and, and people don't pick up or numbers are disconnected or busy and so on. But of those who pick up, um, you know, the, the response rates are around 10%. It doesn't really vary much. It varies from nine to 11. So that's, you know, very similar and not surprising. Um, I should have mentioned also that um, there is a 20% control by supervisors of the um, the calls. So in other words, the supervisors phone back 20% of, of the uh, respondents and ask them, you know, were you phoned by our interviewer and did it go okay and that sort of thing. So again, that's normal procedure for uh, reputable companies. Um, so I think the, Gwen mentioned this and I, uh, in passing in, when she was going through her data, um, I think it's a very important element. When people um, are phoned about controversial topics, um, they tend, sometimes they tend to dodge the question by giving the so-called don't know answers. Um, a couple of years ago, a grad student and I wrote about this in uh, the former 
using surveys across the former Soviet Union, including uh, the de facto states and so on. And, you know, we, again, parse the kind of don't knows, and you can see very clearly uh, the effect of controversial questions. So the question that Jer talked about, the so-called Victoria question, in a way is not nearly as controversial as the questions about, you know, who do you blame for this mess? Um, or the question that Gwen talked about, what do you want the final status of the republics to be? Or even the one, what will you do if Russian troops come to your town or, um, or district? And, and, you know, there the don't knows are lower, but the don't know rate for the key interviewers in the republics is quite high for sensitive questions. It's on the order of 20, 25%, which is much higher than one might normally expect uh, for non-controversial questions, which is usually in the range of you know, five to 10%. So I think there is a very definite effect here of the provenance, the origins of the phone calls that we can see and which in a sense we expected, but now we have a real experiment in terms of the data uh, from these calls. So I leave the speculation to my colleagues. <laughs> okay, should I pick up? Um, maybe I just want to add to what you just said, um, John, that maybe a response rate of above, uh, about 10%, in some cases it was a little more, maybe that sounds low initially, but if we think of the setting um, that we're dealing with and, and also compare that to other survey work in crisis situations and war situations. Um, uh, if we also keep in mind what that means, I mean, it's very, very easy to, um, I mean, anywhere in the world to, to put the phone down and not want to talk in a survey. So um, one has to, I think 10% sounds really low, but one has to put these two, I think, um, elements um, into that equation that it's actually a fairly, fairly normal uh, response rate for, for the, in this kind of a difficult situation. And I can also, um, uh, I assume that there, there would be, if we also had more time today, there would be many, many questions and maybe the question will be posed. Nevertheless, um, if we don't convince you that this kind of work is possible or, or should be done, I just would like to, and I always make this point, and I think we all three make it, um, it's also problematic not to try to get to um, individuals in, in these um, in territories that we have almost no access to that we know little about. And we, we say things about the population, but we don't really get to it. And, and sometimes it's also hard to do this on the government controlled side, close to the contact line. So, um, so I think the three of us share this um, assumption that one should try and be as open about all methodological issues and challenges. And all three companies we used also um, uh, uh, did extended pilots, tried our research, concluded they couldn't this time around do research, sensible um, uh, polling in the non-government controlled areas. Something had, that it's changed in 2019, they were able um, to do it. So I think we, we want to be as transparent about problems, but nevertheless, the bottom line for us is that one should try and get at least a sense of um, certain trends, um, we don't take, probably one should never do that with any survey, but we don't take every single figure as the final result on an issue. But it highlights, I think also, as we have several sort of cross-sectional surveys, certain trends. And with that, I think I, I get to that bigger um, question you asked, um, Mihail. Um, I, I meant to actually emphasize one thing before on, on status, which I forgot, but I do it now. I mean, there are some patterns um, that emerge, although it's cross-sectional data, uh, uh, over time, and this, um, as we are currently um, discussing or following the news on um, the, the um, recognition of in the independent um, territories now, uh, this uh, option of independence um, is has not changed. That's a very consistent result, and only about eight to ten percent in in all surveys over time and at end now want that option. So that just um, kind of maybe confirms something that we, we, we thought we knew already, but just to say it's not really, it's not about, uh, about independence. So I think there are certain things that are also consistent and consistent over time and between survey companies. The, the what we call the Victoria question is, is another example of that. But then we also see, I think over, over time with a careful um, comparison over time, um, I think we see um, so, socioeconomic issues becoming more prevalent on people's minds uh, in comparison to the war and immediate effect of the war, which, which again, I think is, is logical when, when war, um, up to now at least, 
um, uh, becomes some sort of sad normality um, at a certain level and people adjust, but then um, another perception in particular um, socioeconomic need becomes important and that we were struck on a number of questions that we also haven't presented here now how important um, that is. And I think another um, uh, question that shows um, a, a change is um, the question that John presented on who's to blame. And if we focus on who's to blame for the recent escalation, um, then we see that there is um, actually a, a maybe, I thought, surprisingly high number of people or share of people in the government controlled areas. I think you said it in passing, John, uh, but just to emphasize it, who blame Ukraine for this? as much as they blame uh, Russia for this. Um, so as you said, on the non-government controlled area side, it, this, this divide does not exist. And, and yes, on the non-government controlled side, um, the blame for Ukraine is higher, but we're dealing here between sort of 25% in the non-government controlled areas, both surveys combined, and sort of 35 to a bit over 40. So that to me, I think suggests how the areas closest to the contact line on the government controlled side also felt, feel left behind by um, Kiev and what they fear most, of course, is that there's more an extended um, war and, and uh, protracted conflict. But I think I, I leave it here and leave some things for Joa. Sorry. No, I think we should take uh, more questions um, at this point. Okay, thank you. Then uh, now we have several questions coming in first. Uh, Narek Zeferian uh, asking, did the survey companies use different languages, Ukrainian, Russian, or just Russian? Is there this linguistic difference? Again, methodology, probably. And uh, another uh, question. Uh, well, it's connected with uh, more general, uh, general assessment. The post-Soviet de facto states the old ones, those that were in Caucasus and Transnistria, they created certain model of development. Do you see uh, these models, economic, social, political, are being now applied on the non-controlled territories? Uh, is this experience from Abkhazia and Transnistria there, or it's something new and unprecedented? And the third question, which I re rephrase in a philosophical way. Usually polls, especially in, in the areas where populations are living in very difficult political and security conditions, there's no, no, there are no institutions that would provide the citizens to vo with the voice to be heard. And polls is in a way, uh, the, the sociological research uh, polls are an attempt of scholars to hear the Vox Populi. Now that you have this research done, what this Vox is saying, what do residents of Donbass want? Thank you. Um, I, I'll start and others can pile in. Um, so for Nareg, uh, yes, the, the response had a choice of Russian and Ukrainian that was offered up front. And so they could answer. Um, and I think if I remember correctly, um, and, and the company, by the way, reported the ratio, but it was it was something like 90 percent, 85 to 90 percent picked Russian. Uh, even uh, Ukrainians pick Russian as a language of the uh, of the interview. On the question about models compared to de facto states, um, that's a really important question, because obviously here we're looking at a kind of, a, I think, an emerging de facto situation. Um, one thing uh, that I mentioned, but it's worth um, repeating. These are only kind of five questions of a much bigger set of questions. And one of the other questions we have, which is particularly relevant to this uh, question that just came in about um, the kind of how, how people uh, look at the kind of the, the government and the institutions and so on. Um, it turns out actually that the level of uh, trust and rating of the uh, respective authorities on the non-government versus the government controlled area. It's actually higher in the non-government controlled area. What, what surprised me <laughs> more than anything was the um, disdain for the Kyiv government 
in the non sorry in the government controlled areas right in the areas that the Kiev government controls the 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 level of um lack of trust in the Kiev institutions the 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 sense of uh, very poor services you know all of those kinds of things that governments usually provide um those levels of uh, disdain are much higher than in the republics so um that again comes from other data in this particular phone call um, but I'll let others answer that question about institutions as well. Thank you, Gerard. Yeah, I think in one sense that question, it's a, it's a, a very, very good one, uh, but it would take us too far afield. Um, let me just briefly say, you know, these are, these de facto states are, are real places with real people struggling to try to orient them, orientate themselves uh, in a, a world where they are a geopolitical uh, prizes and uh, instruments, territorial levers in, in larger geopolitical games. And obviously we see that playing itself out right now. Uh, and so there is a disjuncture between um, that goal, the sort of instrumentalize them in order to fulfill a particular geopolitical a goal on the part of Russia, and then uh, looking after their welfare. Uh, and, um, I, and I think that, uh, um, you know, that, that disjuncture is one that is worth paying attention to uh, going forward. Uh, what we have observed in all of the places that we have done research is that uh, there's very little genuine uh, organic support for these entities as independent entities with one exception and that is amongst ethnic Abkhaz in Abkhazia uh, where they are very invested in in Abkhazia but if you look at the other um, um, ethnic groups in Abkhazia maybe with a slight exception ironically of a small number of uh, ethnic Russians in Abkhazia uh, they're they're more interested in joining Russia um, and so part of this is simply economic. Russia is much more, it's prosperous relative, in relative terms. These are places that, are, are, that have lost uh, from the collapse of the Soviet Union, and obviously in the Donbass, it's been spectacular in its loss. And then they have lost from this violence visited upon them by outside forces that are playing geopolitical games. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, you have violence, which is a very polarizing fact, uh, factor, an alienating factor for people who are who've experienced it. So therefore, they're very alienated against their uh, so-called uh, parent state, and they therefore uh, don't uh, want to ever join it again. But that does not necessarily translate into support for uh, these entities as sort of independent states in the world. Gwendolyn? Well, I think we should take more questions, maybe just to for you the question about what does Vox Populi tell us? I mean, if it tells us some one thing really clearly is I think what we emphasized um, already that um, people primarily want to live normal lives. No, that's what you just um, outlined as well, um, Gerard, and, and that that is more pronounced among younger people who say um, that they don't mind in which country they live as long as um, socioeconomic conditions or their well-being is, is um, looked after or is um, at, a, at an acceptable level. But I think so that is, I think, one, one um, message that comes out of it. And we can see um, if we go with the Levada data, um, then there seems to be a strengthening of um, a, a, a position or a, an orientation towards, towards Russia, which, however, I think is in combination with that. Um, economic or socioeconomic argument in our in our story here. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And we will make this last round since our time is about to finish. The last round of questions. So we have a question from Robert Gerkel. Uh, to what extent do you think that conveying Russian citizenship has changed the uh, identity issue for the respondents of the survey? And the second question is more connected with uh, political pragmatics. Uh, what is the proportion of the population on uncontrolled territories 
to which Ukrainian government can speak and can use as the future agents for reintegration. And uh, since it's the last, last round, I also ask you to add some more information or uh, conclusions that you might have from this research. Thank you. Uh, why don't we start with Gwendolyn Ray? Thank you. Okay, maybe I, I start on the citizenship point and um, we've asked a number of questions on sort of that touch on citizenship and identity and, and we're simply not ready with the analysis yet, but we asked, um, and the reason for that is that we asked, and I think a, um, sort of a very honest and open way, we asked people to, to tell us what um, citizenship or citizenships they have. Um, and uh, we need to, however, that takes longer to code. Um, so we, we want to get a sense of that, um, what people say and whether they have dual citizenship and so on. We know, of course, that um, uh, without doing this um, survey research that um, I think an estimated 600 to 700,000 passports were handed out. Uh, well, that were figures from last year. So probably it's gone up since, in particular in the one up also to the Duma elections. And um, so I think uh, there's a compelling story that um, on, on the one hand, um, these passports um, are, um, are, are, are handed out rather easily. They also stand for access to, be it social assistance, um, uh, goods, and, and so on. So there's also a socioeconomic explanation of why that is attractive. That might not have to be, that might not be driven by identity um, issues or a preference for a particular status. But if, as happens to be the case, um, crossing the contact line is, is getting harder and harder, um, and, and was already difficult to begin with to claim, for example, your pension in person on the other side, um, then I think there's, there's one of, there's one of that, those dynamics at work here. But we also asked, in addition to what, what um, passport people have, uh, we asked the, the typical question about, um, well, in English, the term is misleading nationality. That used to be not so nonist. Um, uh, there is a discussion, and those of you who follow the discussions, it's no longer clear what you actually capture with that, if it is more of an ethnic category or has by now become in people's minds a more civic state-centered notion. We have that in there, and we showed one result where, where things align fairly clearly, if it says Ukrainian or Russian has, has certain views in terms of where the, the territories belong. But we think that that is too simple. Um, and we also have a question, but that will also take some more time on people's um, self-identification as what do they identify. And this time we also tried not to um, uh, already preform categories, um, which we did in the past, which tried to give a lot of options, but said things like Ukrainian citizen or Ukrainian by descent and, and language identities. And now people could say uh, spontaneously what they wanted, but again, that um, with the number of um, answers we're dealing with will take some time to, for us to get through. And, and we think out of those, maybe we become a, we get a slightly more nuanced um, view there. I mean, the superficial impression is that the sense of being a Ukrainian citizen has, has weakened on the side of the government control, non-government non control areas, which, which one would probably expect over, over time but um, more details um, to come from that. Um, thank you very much. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thank you. Gerard, would you like to continue? Um, the, the question about uh, the, the occupied territories, the, no, the non-government controlled territories, uh, um, the, that's an extremely difficult. Uh, issue and uh, you know it is one that involves questions of reconciliation and no matter what happens you know Russia and Ukraine are going to be neighbors uh, all into the future and uh, you know the tragedy of the current moment where it looks like a new violence is going to be unleashed is that it will take an awful long time to undo the effects of that because it is uh, very, very polarizing. Um, and um, there will be certain uh, populations that are simply irreconcilable uh, as a consequence of the use of violence against them by their, uh, their own government. And uh, so the that is uh, a kind of a harsh reality and uh, the 
one thing that comes out of that Victoria question is quite clearly that having a state that is functional, that serves its citizens, um, provides good social services, um, is, is absolutely vital for legitimacy. Uh, and it will, um, you know, attract people. Uh, and uh, right now, uh, that is not something that has, has happened. Uh, and, you know, in both th these areas, they are suffering from economic decline and uh, relative deprivation of uh, basic social services. And so we need to keep that front and center rather than the geopolitical issue to sort of reorientate our stories of these regions around the everyday conditions of, of people that are uh, living in these areas rather than looking at the larger geopolitical uh, agendas and gambits that are going on. Thank you very much. And John, uh, for you, the concluding remarks. Uh, thank you. Um, as I said, um, this is just a bit of a much bigger uh, survey. And I would like to actually go back to that one question about um, what can Kiev do for people in the um, non-government controlled areas? We have questions about, um, did you move since the beginning of the conflict? And where did you move from? So, so we, we asked people uh, to tell us the city or the rayon that they were living in. Uh, which is important for a couple of reasons. One is we can connect it obviously to the line of contact and see how close they are to the line. And that obviously uh, would be related to um, worries about the war and its effects and shelling and so on. Um, but the question about uh, where did you move from, I think is an important one because that will allow us to track if there has been a kind of a self-sorting going on of uh, different groups from different areas. So. Again, uh, there has been speculation. I don't know if it, I haven't seen anything that shows it clearly, uh, other than anecdotally, that um, people, uh, especially of uh, Ukrainian background, who left the non government controlled areas and went to the government controlled areas, um, have very different attitudes, um, in a way more uh, irreconcilable attitudes, as Jared was, was talking about, than people who remained. Um, but again, it's important to know that we're trying to give a view from the ground of, of uh, people caught up in these horrible circumstances and of which they have no control uh, over which they are, in a sense, pawns being um, kind of battered back and forth by um, geopolitical actors who, you know, in some ways um, don't really care about them. Um, and, and that's really what we've tried to kind of put front and center. And I believe that. Um, it is obviously a very difficult area to work in, as we talked earlier, um, but I think it's fair enough to say that uh, at least their voices are being heard uh, in a way, perhaps, that um, you don't see more than some interviews by journalists uh, in these areas, um, kind of small numbers of people who journalists talk to. We're literally talked to, if you think about it, over 4,000 people. That's an enormous number of voices uh, that are in this uh, database. So I'll stop there and yes. thank, thank you, you very Mikhail. much. Thank you very much colleagues for bringing this voice to us and making this research in very unfavorable conditions. I, I understand that everything is done in these tragic moments when the, uh, the violence can be unleashed any moment and in Donbass, but also my folks, my, my family is from Zaporizhia is from nearby and I read every news and hear every voice from the region with special attention. Uh, and uh, Gwendolyn Zasse, John Laughlin, Jared Toll, thank you very much for today's discussion. Uh, and uh, thank you to our audience for joining us today. Please visit our website if you'd like to stay up to date with upcoming events and publications, as well as our podcast, Canonix and the Russia File. You can find our latest analysis of events in Russia, Ukraine, or the region on our Russia file and Focus Ukraine blogs. You can also find an article from our speakers on this data from a recent Monkey Cage blog published last week, which is also linked to our web website. I'd like to thank again the Center for East European and International Studies, so it's in Berlin, uh, for 
for sponsoring today's event. See you next time and thank you.